Good morning, everybody. Good to see you this morning. If you need notes, by the way, they're in the back, or if you raise your hand, I think some ushers will bring you some notes if you need them, teaching notes. And, of course, they're also available um, online. So uh, my wife and I relocated from uh, upstate New York to Kansas City 15 years ago to join the staff of IHOP KC, and it's really a privilege for us to be serving on the uh, pastoral staff under uh, Pastor Isaac Morgan Bennett. Um, so it was mentioned earlier about the uh, book that we wrote, Vertical Marriage. We can just put that slide up again real quick. Uh, this is a book that we recommend, of course, for premarital couples, but also for married couples because there's always like a refreshing that we need in our marriages. So it's available this morning right here in the 400 Bookstore. It's also available um, online. And we also have a website, and I have like over 200 blogs mostly on marriage. So if you're really zealous about reading about marriage, just check out our website. There's over 200 blogs there. You get to it by just Googling Mike Rizzo Vertical Marriage. Just Google those four words, Mike Rizzo Vertical Marriage, and our website will pop up. Okay, are you ready to come into my classroom today? We're going to be really practical today because messages, they need to be practical, right? So I'm going to start out by talking about uh, what a vertical marriage is to us, a vertical marriage is a Christ-focused partnership of personal transformation. It is a husband and wife loving God and one another while living in expectation of the return of the bridegroom. By the way, I'm focusing on two major groups today in my message. One is married couples, and the other is singles. So if that's you, this is for you. So many years ago, my wife were, and I were engaged, 1980, at our Bible college in upstate New York, and we read this book called Destined for the Throne by Paul Bilheimer, and the whole premise of the book was that this whole life that we're living is God preparing us and training us for future rulership with him in the age to come. And this marked our hearts, and we just like said yes, and we sought to live our life in that way, 25 years later, we come to IHOP and we hear uh, Mike Bickle teaching on how this life is just an internship. These few years that we have here is just an internship. The Lord's training us. The only chance he gets to train us with not unglorified bodies. And it's preparing us for future rulership with him. And so we're like, the dots are connecting for us. We like this place. So we love, love, love this message. And I love this verse in Philippians chapter 3. That says, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body so he may be conformed to his glorious body. And I did a little word study on uh, what eagerly means. And it means assiduously or patiently. It also means indefatigable. I wanted to say that word, indefatigable, fatigable, which means persisting tirelessly. So think that road trip you're on with your kids or your grandkids. Daddy, how much longer till we get to the hotel? You know, are we there yet? That's eager, persisting tirelessly. And that's to be our vantage point, our perspective as we wait for the Lord's return and long for his return. And so when a couple's on the same page with this, I think it's really a positive thing in the marriage because it'll affect your values, it'll affect your priorities in some way. But it's not just the expectation of the event of his return that will strengthen your marriage, it's in the transformation that comes from that expectation. In other words, the transformation of your lowly body, which has already begun. And we know from the scripture that we have the power of the age to come. We've tasted of the power of the age to come as a down payment of what transformation feels like. Now, I was 21 years old, going nowhere in my life, just a pothead, drunk, depressed most of the time. 
And at 21, someone led me to Christ and I did a massive 180. I became a new creature in Christ. My life was totally different. I tasted of the power of age to come, his transforming power. That's kind of like when the future bride and groom go to the, the caterer for the food tasting. It's not the wedding feast yet, but it's the same food you'll be eating when the wedding feast comes. So we have a substantial transformative taste. So my lowly body, as you can see, isn't glorified yet, but there's something different in me. And Peter says, we are partakers of the divine nature. Wow, powerful verse. So we're all about becoming the radiant bride. Roman numeral one. The desire of Jesus is to present the bride to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And I love this translation from the, the message version. Christ's love makes the church whole. His words evoke her beauty. Everything he does and says is designed to bring the best out of her, dressing her in dazzling white silk, radiant with holiness. So that's what heaven's thinking as they're overseeing the formation, transformation, the making ready of the bride. That's what they're thinking. And so all believers, married or single, were on this glorious bridal journey together. Revelation 19, let us be glad, rejoice, give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. So that's what's happening in our lives now. We're being made ready. We sang the song today. And I love, love, love the, the lyric, there's going to be a wedding. It's the reason that I'm living to marry the lamb. And when you translate that into a marriage scenario, you've probably never ever, I don't think I've maybe never ever said it to my wife or, or said it together. It's the reason that we're living, to marry the lamb. Wow, imagine that. I mean, you can say that to your spouse right now if you want to, feel free, wherever you are. Hey, honey, the reason that we're living is to marry the lamb. What? How does that translate into practicals? We'll talk about that. So we don't use the words, you know, every, every night at the dinner table, bridal paradigm, vertical marriage, right? But a Christ-focused partnership of personal transformation, that's the essence of our relationship and I think needs to be the essence of any marriage. So for this to happen we have to be kind of cooperating with the Holy Spirit, with his work in our lives, which comes to the topic, Roman numeral two, of self-awareness. I love this John Calvin quote, without knowledge of self, there's no knowledge of God. Our wisdom, insofar as it ought to be deemed true and solid wisdom, consists almost entirely of two parts, the knowledge of God, and of ourselves. But as these are connected by many ties, it is not easy to determine which of the two precedes and gives birth to the other. So God says to us, you know, this is who I am, you know, come and get to know me, study my attributes, study my word, worship me, focus on me. And yes, we need to do that. Then there's other times he says, uh, Mike, um, I wanna show you who you are. There's some areas as transformed as you are. Being 47 years a Christian, I love you. There's some areas we still need to work on and transform in your life and I need you to know your true self. I need you to see these areas. Because seldom do they just change and we say, Lord, just change me, you know, whatever you wanna do. Now he's gonna be very specific. And we all know people that have a great God awareness quote all the scriptures, worship leader, preacher, whatever you want, whatever. But you can kind of sometimes tell, like this person doesn't seem like authentic to me, truly. I don't think they really know themselves because if they saw 
their blind spots, they'd be working on them, right? So if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Powerful prayer to pray. Lord, whatever it takes, I want to walk in the light in my personal life and in my marriage. Letter B, self-awareness is one of the most accurate reflections of God awareness. In other words, the more I know him, the more I know me. My wife likes to say, you know, the closer you get to the light, to, to his brilliance, it's gonna reveal things in your life, which is a good thing. And, you know, we've seen couples that kind of cut corners here. And when couples cut corners here in this area of self-awareness, they will end up frustrated. Because one spouse is wishing the other would change and that spouse is wishing the other would change. If only they'd be aware of their stuff. If only they'd be aware of their stuff. Really important. Authenticity is our friend. Not always comfortable, but always fruitful. And I read this quote one time. It said, one of the best wedding gifts God gave you was a full-length mirror called your spouse. And had there been a card attached, it would have read, here's to helping you discover what you really like. <laughs> so true. Many years ago, I, I kind of heard this sentence in my mind that I felt was the Lord speaking to me one day. It said, God will bring up the worst in you to bring out the best in you. You know, we ask for it, right? Refiner's fire, my heart's one desire. You know, we ask for this deep change and transformation. God's like, yeah, I love you. Let's, let's, let's bring up this area. I want to transform it. Oh, let's not look at that. I've got that safely tucked away. It's really refreshing when one spouse says to the other, honey, um, God's revealed some things in my heart that I need to work on. Uh, and I'm gonna really pray and by God's grace make some changes in my life. And I think it'd be really good if we had some discussions together about it too as God's working on me. Like what planet is, what, where, where are these couples that say things like that? But it's what we're longing to hear. And you know, after 40 years of sitting with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of couples, this is what I've discovered. Self-awareness, authenticity, communication, being vulnerable. It's what helps a marriage to thrive. So let's talk about what gets in the way. Remember number three, relational walls. I'm preaching to myself today, by the way. And tomorrow morning, when I begin my week, I'll be working on areas of my life and making sure things are good within my own soul. You know, growing up, we, we all experience um, some form of trauma or wounding in our lives. Everybody does to some degree. And we survive by defending ourselves. And one of the most common defense mechanisms that we use is to build up an emotional wall to help separate us from the pain. And then we grow up and we're adults with these walls. And they can keep us from being fully present in our current relationships. Walls can make for a very lonely marriage. One of our Bible school instructors said once that it's better to be alone than with someone and lonely. And I have empathized over the years with Many, many spouses that are just so, so lonely and feeling isolated in their marriages. So let's go through these walls. Letter A, the wall of isolation. Rather than choosing to be vulnerable with our feelings, we keep them to ourselves. What are you thinking, honey? I'm nothing, right? Feelings are the deepest part of a person. And so the less we share them, the more isolated we may feel while also kind of keeping a distance between us and other people. 
Many spouses will isolate themselves from one another, but because you need an outlet somewhere, you'll talk to that best bro or best sister, and you'll share things with them about what you're going through. And that's okay to a point, but I can remember times in our marriage here and there where I would share something to a close brother about what I was struggling with, and then I would kind of mention it in the, in the hearing of my wife that I shared such and such with so-and-so, and she would be, you didn't tell me about that. And I'd feel convicted, like, yeah, I should have shared that with you to stay connected. Let her be the wall of denial. Does anybody know anybody in denial in your life that you'd like to wish they would get a revelation? Denial. Every problem or conflict has something to do with me. Healthy resolution can only come about when both people take responsibility for their portion. So in a marriage or if you're single with your best friend, you know, even if one person is majorly responsible for an issue, it's never 100 to zero. I've had spouses try to convince me it's 100 to zero. I'm good. He is 100. It's his, totally, totally his issues. It's at least 1% yours. You got to own something in this. Denial is a very thick and powerful, obstructive wall. And there's a wall of withdrawal. This is the tendency to run away instead of dealing with the issues. So fighting, I mean, healthy fighting is actually uh, just a natural consequence of two very different people becoming one. Of course you're gonna fight in your marriage. It's healthy to fight. Failing to engage in hard conversations will build up a dam of inner dialogue within you because you're still arguing with him or her on the inside. You're still rehearsing that in your inner dialogue. And if that continues on, it builds resentment. It can build bitterness. And the worst of all, it can result in contempt. When a couple has reached a place of contempt towards one another, it's very, very difficult to resolve. It's possible but it's very, very difficult, especially if it's been over a long period of time. Letter D, the wall of displacement. This is the uh, kicking the dog syndrome. Taking out your negative emotions on someone who doesn't deserve them. The husband's at work, you know, he's really frustrated. He's struggling with his job and various other things. So he comes, comes home, his wife welcomes him home and and she just casually mentions in a really sweet way, hey, baby, uh, when do you think we should start renovating that back bedroom? You know, strip that wallpaper. And he just like lashes out. He displaces all that he's got boiling inside of him onto her. Displacement. Okay, time for a deep breath. We're halfway through the walls. There's four. And you're, in your mind, you're checking off. I don't have that one. I don't have that one. Eh, maybe I don't have that one. Listen, I got walls. Let me just confess. I have walls. But here's the thing with walls. Walls are very easy to overcome when they're recognized in their early stages. So if there's only one row of brick up, you can step over that thing. You could resolve that thing. You could pray through that thing. Even knee high, even chest high, I can see over this wall. I'm going to take ownership of this. But when they get so high and so thick that you can't even see beyond them anymore, that could be trouble. And I empathize with couples we've counseled over the past 40 years that because of childhood wounding and trauma, there's walls, there's walls, and they become kind of um, apparent in the, in the course of the marriage. Letter E, the wall of invalidation. I'm gonna tell you right now, I struggle with this one. The wall of invalidation. This is when we fail to recognize, acknowledge, speak out, or communicate the good things in the people around us. It's not saying something when we should. Now, I won't go into my you know, whole history here <laughs> this morning. There's no time. My childhood, why I tend to be judgmental and negative and am not the greatest encourager. But I've come a long way. I recognize this wall, this thing in my life a long time ago. And, uh, and I still need to be intentional to be an encourager to my wife and to my family. 
It's easy to point out the flaws in people. Anybody find that difficult to do, by the way? It's almost automatic. It just comes to us naturally. But we have to be intentional to point out the strengths. And by not doing so with your wife or with your best friend, whatever the situation, can actually be a wall of invalidation. Letter F, the wall of fantasy. Fantasy is not only sexual, but anything we use to escape from the reality of life. And there's a bottom line here. Fantasy allows for something less important to take the place of what's most important, your marriage. Your marriage is the most important relationship in your life, aside from the Lord. It's okay to escape in healthy ways, of course, you know, going on vacation, watching a movie, that's, that's cool. But we have to watch our priorities and the proportion of time that we are escaping or getting away. Letter G, the wall of passive aggressive. Passive aggressive is when we fail to use words but default to indirect negative behaviors. And the pattern here is that your words don't match your actions. So as a couple, you're talking about, you know, vacation plans or some other project in the house or something, and you have different ideas. You don't agree. But you begrudgingly, you know, agree to, with, with your spouse that, okay, we'll do it that way. But you kind of keep your feelings to yourself. But then all during that week, you're kind of closing doors a little roughly. You're kind of acting a little irritable and rude towards your spouse. That's passive aggressive. I'm fine. I'm fine. Let's forget about it. No, I'm good. Next day, next day, next day, you're still acting out. Or for me, if I'm wrestling with something in my soul, an issue in my personal life, and I'm, I'm trying to work on it, but I'm struggling, um, sometimes it will spill out from me towards my wife as maybe being a little short, tones a little negative. Letter H, it's our last one. The wall of rage. Rage is anger 2.0. It's off the charts, anger. And anger is a secondary emotion. Deep down underneath the anger, there's always another emotion. There's connected to some kind of pain. And my own personal battle over the years has, has been with uh, the area of shame, just feeling like, you know, who I am is not enough. Battle with shame over the years. And a few years ago, I was um, scrolling through Facebook and I saw some pics uh, from a friend's birthday celebration, which I was not invited to, by the way. And it wasn't my best friend, but it was a guy that we had a relationship together. We had dinner at each other's houses and everything. And I saw these pictures and all of a sudden, w without warning, it shot up like a rocket inside of me, anger. Strong anger just popped up. Now that's a secondary emotion. The root emotion was people don't really want to spend time with you. You're just like not enough. You, you don't belong with the popular crowd, you know, the old high school challenge, right? And there it was. And so when those things happen, I have to say, What's at the core of me? What, why, why, did, why am I feeling angry about this or this? Or why do I feel this or this? And taking ownership of it is so essential. Because the core lie that I came to believe as a child, and I realized this later, you know, as a child, you don't have the cognitive thoughts to see exactly what's going on, how you're being programmed or imprinted upon. But when you look back, you know, for me, it was you are not worth spending time with. That was the core banner over my life. It was my dad, my two older brothers, almost no time spent with me at all. And so that was kind of a conclusion that was proved out by their behavior. You're not worth spending time with. So I'm thankful over 47 years of Christianity, I have come light years in growth. But I'm also wise enough to know that I can slip back into that default mode without too much trouble if I don't stay intentional. Does that make sense?
So Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted, set the captive free, amen, right? And marriage is hard work at times. But if we're willing to walk in the light, if you're willing to have a conversation over lunch today, couples, hey, how about these eight walls, right? Come on. Okay, I want to talk to singles a little bit, but, but marrieds, please, um, please keep listening. Okay, let's go right for the juggler. Roman numeral four, unrealistic expectations. You will never feel whole in the presence of your mate if you don't feel whole standing alone. Now, I know on the front end, it kind of seems like, you know, that's, what it's, that's what's going to happen. But relationships cannot erase your insecurities. God uses relationships in our healing, of course. But no one has the power to deal with our insecurities but ourselves. My wife can't take my thoughts captive for me. Wouldn't that be good? She can encourage me and help me along. And she's, my wife's a strong leader. I'm not sure what her Enneagram is, but she's a choleric type personality and she's not afraid to call me out. She, don't think like that. Yes, dear. And I appreciate her strong encouragement. I really do. Because she knows me. So dating inward. I like, I like this concept that one author uh, talks about. Dating inward requires a shift in thinking that puts the focus on who you are rather than whom you are with. We've seen a lot of sing- singles just kind of hit the pause button on their own personal growth because they've met Ken or Barbie or whoever they are today. I'm, I'm, that's an old illustration. <laughs> no, Barbie, focus on your growth. Ken is not the answer to your life and vice versa. We look for the perfect mate, letter, letter B. We look for the perfect mate not realizing we've neglected the perfecting of ourselves because every single married couple will acknowledge the fact that once you're married, the perfecting of yourself is gonna continue. <laughs> so get it going, keep it going while you're single and then just transition in the marriage and keep doing the same thing. Roman numeral six, develop a vision for your life, singles. The bigger picture, your story has far more to do with finding God's unique calling and purpose for your life than it does with finding the love of your life. Now, I know it's, there's balance here, right? I mean, you know, you got these singles events and different kinds of things to facilitate meeting somebody. Cool, cool, cool. There's got to be a bigger picture besides just finding that person. Find your unique calling. Even though we've been married for 41 years, Ann and I, we still individually are seeking God for our own personal lives and what he has for us. What what is he saying to us individually? That's always going to continue on through your marriage. And then we share that with each other, of course. Number seven, true love versus need love. Many who feel that they've fallen in love may eventually realize that they've just fallen in need. The relationship is purely meeting a need in them, a need to be wanted, a need to be valued, a need to be affirmed. I just feel so good around her. She's made a difference in my life. But here's the thing. Letter A, need love drives you toward one another because of your disparity. It binds you together in codependency. And that's a whole other message right there. But we've seen it, again, to reiterate, over the past 40 years of meeting with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of couples, when things have dried up, you can trace it back oftentimes right here. Need love Fools two empty people into thinking they can fill one another up, but in the end, fulfillment never comes. They feel more and more depleted and their needs grow even greater in the shadow of this false love. And again, I I even feel emotion now. I feel empathy now in my heart towards couples that have made this discovery 
Of course, it's totally fixable, transformable, yes, by the power of God, hard work, revelation, counsel, encouragement. Let's skip over to Roman numeral eight. The timeline of transformation. This is our scare tactic with premarital couples. I joke. We say, we are making the decision in marriage to fully support, intercede for, and encourage one primary person on their journey through life. And we are relying on them to do the same for us. We just casually share that with premarital couples. Are you ready to do this? No, we don't say it that way. But we lay that out there to say, this is the commitment you're wanting to make. It's really great that you found each other. We love your relationship. We're going to try and help you. But this is the commitment because no one can know at the beginning of the journey what lies ahead. It's impossible to know exactly how your spouse-to-be is going to grow and mature or not over the decades. We've talked with a lot of couples that that feel stuck in this place. In our book, we talk about an example from scripture. I use the Emmaus Road as kind of a little metaphor. Two disciples walking with Jesus and they didn't recognize him at first, but then they received revelation later on. They received revelation at the same time and their, their eyes were open. Their hearts were burning. Their eyes were open. They recognized Christ. In our book, I say that seasons of joint growth are the most pleasant in a marriage. The testing comes when one heart burns and the other does not. When one set of eyes are opened and the other remains veiled. Now, in, in just simple things, it's okay. Like if Ann and I go to a service and, you know, she's getting rocked by the message, her eyes are closed, her hands are just, you know, open and she's receiving from the Lord and she looks over at me and I'm looking through my Facebook. That really happened. True confession. Or on the, on the drive home, honey, what a, that message, didn't that really touch your heart? And you're like, yeah, it was all right. Because we're on, we're on different cycles. We're not going to be exactly always at the same place as a married couple growing in exactly the same way. That's okay. But where it becomes an issue is, is where one spouse perhaps isn't seeing anything or being stirred by anything for a long time. And the other spouse is waiting and praying. And again, I, I empathize with that situation. In our marriage, there was a thing that happened in year 12 that we didn't know was going to happen. We were pastoring. We were on staff at this large church, and uh, I was living the life. I was overseeing the counseling department. I was teaching in the Bible school. Our kids were like 8, 10, 12 years old. They had friends. We were all set. I'd been in that church for 18 years. The pastor was like my father figure. And one day, out of the blue... Um, the pastor wanted to meet with Ann and I. And so at the meeting, he said, I think it's time for you guys to move on. And maybe like, you know, spread your wings a little bit, maybe pastor your own church. And we were like just stunned. And um, I had kind of a minor meltdown at the time. Um, They had a going away party for me at the church as, as they were giving us the, you know, release and uh, there was no problems there at all. It was just, that's just how it was happening. And so um, people could see that I was very uh, depressed. I was very downcast. And the first year, we took the pastorate of this little church of about 30, 40 people. I was 39 years old. Most of the people in the church were like my age now, 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, there was no real worship in the church. And I was going to be the pastor of this little church. And... If you had recorded my prayer life during that first year of being at that church, you would have heard a lot of um, beep, beep, beep. You would have had to bleep out a lot of things from my, my... I was being open and honest with God 
pacing that little church, praying in those early months. And I was just releasing whatever was in me. I think he can handle that when we have little things like that happening. But we stayed there for 10 years. There were ebbs and flows, and, and, but a lot of good things happened. A lot of people were touched. And looking back in hindsight, I'm so thankful that that happened. It's one of the things that helped to get us here. And it also revealed how little I love people. He set me in this church. I want you to love on these people. And coming from the church I was at, it was a major demotion in my career. But my wife stood with me, so no one, I didn't know in year 12 that was going to happen. Things are going to happen, you know, and we are there to support each other, and we're there to help each other. I want to just finish up with uh, Roman numeral 9. I love this um, Bible verse from Philippians. I think maybe when you're in marriage ministry, you see a lot of verses in the Bible as marriage verses. I'm not sure, but I, this is a marriage verse for me. I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. You know, Paul was grateful for the church in Philippi, and I feel the same towards my wife. She's been a faithful partner for decades, best friend for decades. And our partnership in the gospel is the strongest bond we share. It doesn't sound too romantic. Uh, if you're courting or you're engaged, you know, early on, you, you got the nice dinner, you got the flowers. Honey, let's have a partnership in the gospel. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not gonna be on a greeting card, right? But, but this is the absolute foundation. You can sprinkle on and add on all the romance. and You can always add that stuff on very easily. But our partnership in the gospel is the strongest bond that we share. It's a Christ-focused partnership of personal transformation. As the worship team comes up, I'm gonna have my wife come up as well. Paul goes on in Philippians to say, um, it's right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. I long for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. I don't always feel affection towards my beautiful wife. I don't always feel it. And but when I'm aligned with what Christ in me feels towards her, then I'm tapping into that supernatural affection. I long for you with the affection of Christ. Now, I do feel some affection. Don't think I'm just a statue up here. But I've often heard the comment from a, a spouse in a difficult marriage, you know, I don't feel any more affection. The chemistry's gone. Wet matches, nothing striking, nothing's lighting. I understand there's many reasons for that. I'm not trying to oversimplify it. But the question I have to ask is, you know, are you, have you been, are you interceding for him, interceding for her, asking to see them in the same way that Christ sees them? So I'm gonna ask us to stand this morning In couples, I want to encourage you to just pray this prayer in your heart. Husbands, wives, Lord, Lord, give me eyes to see my wife. Give me eyes to see my husband through the lens of your eyes. How do you see them?